All right, well, good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bibles, Colossians chapter 3. And uh, if you don't have a Bible back in that cabinet, there should be a blue softback Bible with your name on it, our gift to you. Uh, We want to preach through the Bible verse by verse. Uh, each and every time we gather as a church. And so uh, if, if you haven't been with us in a while, or you've never been with us before, when we started the church, this thing feels really sketchy. I'm watching this. It might fall. If it does, we'll just go with it, guys. Uh, uh, as we started our church, we started in the book of Colossians, and, and we called the sermon series Matchless. And, and we wanted to start in Colossians for a reason. So let me just kind of catch us up as we pressed pause for Advent and we pressed pause for January prayer month. Let me just kind of catch us up to where we've been. So we picked Colossians uh, because of of the New Testament books, it is the one that is the most Christ focused. Not that other books are devoid of Christ, they're not, but Paul just puts such emphasis on the person and work of Jesus Christ and does so much to exalt who he is and what he has done. And we're, we're calling this sermon series Matchless because we are celebrating that Jesus alone is Savior. Jesus alone is Lord. Jesus alone is King. He is God and he possesses the name that is above every name. So he is without rival. He is without equal. Or what we are saying is he is matchless. He has no match in heaven or on earth. And so in the first two chapters, we saw the matchless nature of Jesus Christ on display in in two different ways. So in, in the first way, we see Jesus, Jesus being matchless is in his personhood. So in chapter one, Paul does everything he can to lift high the person of Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus is preeminent, which is to say Jesus is supreme or Jesus is first or foremost or chief among all people. There's no person that can match Jesus Christ. And the reason why is the fullness of the deity of God dwells within Jesus Christ. He is God. Jesus, when you look at him as a person, he's not some kind of ethical giant or master teacher or or some guy that has this life thing figured out. He is God. He is king. He is matchless. So we see that throughout chapter one. And then in chapter two, we see the matchless work of Jesus Christ. We see that because of our sin, we have built up this debt against God that we could never hope to pay off. And Jesus Christ takes that debt and through his work on the cross, he pays the punishment that we deserve to pay and he pays off our record of debt against God as he satisfies the wrath of God in our place. And not only that, but he puts the enemy to open shame, showing that Satan has no power over the believer. Jesus has redeemed us. He has reconciled us. He has restored us. He has renewed us. The work of Jesus Christ is matchless and it is only through the work of Jesus that you can be saved. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. So that is to say the gospel of Jesus Christ is matchless. Through Jesus, we can have salvation and life forevermore. That's just the intro. I'm getting warmed up, guys, but I'm, I'm, I'm hyped today, as you can tell. I'm so stoked to get back in Colossians. Now, we're going to turn our attention today to, to chapter 3. So Paul, uh, if you don't know this, Paul never met the Colossian church. He didn't plant this church. Uh, one of his buddies did, but he had good relationship with what was going on in Colossae. So he's familiar with what was happening there. Now, what you can expect from someone who hadn't met a church or a people group. And and when these letters were written, they were meant to be read aloud in the assembly uh, from the person who received the letter. So what you can expect from the writer, if you never met these people, they might beat around the bush a little bit. They might be a little timid, like, hey guys, I'm just loving, you know, just trying to help you out here a little bit. But that's, that's just not who Paul is. See, Paul's typical writing style in his letters is for the first half of his books, what he's gonna do is hit you with theology, 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 gospel, gospel, gospel. He really wants you to understand the gospel. And then the second half of his books, what he'll do is he'll transition into the implications of the gospel. 
Now that you understand the gospel, this is how you live. Now that you are loved by Christ and you know you are in Christ, this is how you live for Christ and this is how you live like Christ. And Colossians is no different. So in chapters one and two, Paul gives us gospel, gospel, gospel. And then here in chapters, chapter three, and then we'll see in chapter four, Paul will transition to now that you know who Christ is and what Christ has done, this is how you live for him. But before I jump into the text, I just, I feel so pressed to remind us of something this morning. A works-based righteousness can never save you and it will always fail you. Your good works can never save you. Now, the reason why I feel pressed to say that is we're gonna see, you heard it read and we're gonna see two different lists here in chapter three. You're gonna see a list of vices and virtues, put to death these things, put on these things. And the propensity of the human heart is to hang a scoreboard on the wall, put a bad column and put a good column. And then we're gonna read this list and we see it as things to measure ourselves against and say, I'm nailing that one. Okay, I'm not really hitting that one. I got that one down. I'm doing that one. That one doesn't apply to me. And the hope in our human heart, what we want to do is we want to weigh a scale with more things in our favor that we're doing good rather than things that we're doing bad. And friends, that is moralism and a works-based righteousness where the scriptures will teach us throughout the totality of scriptures that we were conceived in iniquity and we participated in that sin. And the bad column is infinitely long and the good column is is nil. And it is only through the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to us that we can hope to be saved. So a works-based righteousness cannot save you and it will always fail you. But by the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, we can be saved. It is only by grace, through faith in Christ as a gift of God that we can experience salvation. And the reason why I want to hit that so hard up front is I don't want us to look at this as kind of a menu of options and then walk out here, walk out of here today trying to earn the love of God. Rather, what the Bible teaches us is we work from a place of acceptance, not to a place of acceptance. So for the Christian in the room, you are accepted, loved, forgiven, freed in Christ Jesus. That is how God sees you and nothing can change that. But because that is your reality, you now have a new heart and new desires to live like Christ Jesus. We don't work to earn his love. We work from a place of his love. So here's the breakdown. Here's how we're going to look at these 17 verses. In verses one through four, we're going to look at our identity in Christ. The second part, verses five through 11, we're going to look at kind of what we're calling growing pains. Uh, verses 12 through 14, we'll look at the ideal of the Christian life. And then the fourth part, we'll look at our communal growth in verses 15 through 17. So first, let's begin with our identity in Christ. Look back at verses one through four with me. God's word says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This is our identity in Christ. Now, uh, if you're kind of struggling a little bit with your own Bible reading, let me just give you a, a kind of Bible reading tip here. When you're reading any given passage, one thing you want to keep your eyes open to is repetition. Do you see anything on repeat in the passage that you're reading? And so we did here, and the, one of the words we saw on repeat in these verses, we might easily kind of gloss over because it feels like it's just a connector word. So what we see on repeat is the word with. In verse one, if then you have been raised with Christ, jump down to verse three, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse four, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him or with Christ in glory. Paul is teaching here a withness to Christ, a unity with Christ that through faith, when we turn from our sins and trust in Jesus Christ, we are united to Christ and nothing can separate us from him. We are with Christ and he is with us. And this is our fundamental and foundational identity. This is our position in Christ. So he begins, if then you have been raised with Christ. 
So what Paul is doing there is, is, is he's continuing his train of thought that he had going in chapter two. And in chapter two, verse 20, he says, if you have died with Christ, And then here in verse one, he says, if you have been raised with Christ. So he is talking about our positional identities that we get through the work of Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. When Christ dies for the Christian in the room, you have died with him. Your sin has died with him. And when Christ was raised, you were raised with Christ Jesus in a spiritual sense. You have been raised to new life. And then Paul goes on to say, not only that, but your life is hidden with Christ, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He is highly exalted and Christ is occupying the throne of God. This is where we are. We, Christian, are simultaneously here physically and spiritually. We are hidden with Christ in God. So what does that mean for us? That means we are eternally secure. It means we will not be separated from God. It means we can do nothing to lose our salvation. It means we can do nothing to cause God to love us any less. This is our fundamental and foundational identity. Listen, Christian in the room, before you are conservative or liberal, you are Christian. Before you are American or non-American, you are Christian. Before you are educated or uneducated, you are Christian. Before you are wealthy or poor, you are Christian. Before you are Asian, African American, why you are Christian. This is our fundamental and foundational identity with Christ, united to Christ, Christian. This is who we are. Now, I am so glad Paul starts here because Paul is not going to jump into these lists and say, go do these things by your own effort. Paul is going to do these things. Paul is going to say, do these things because of who you are. You are now be. You are Christian, now be Christian. You are in Christ, now be with Christ. And we cannot divorce our identity from our sanctification. Every time we try to grow devoid and divorced from our identity in Christ, we're gonna run out of fumes. We're gonna run on fumes, we're gonna run out of gas. But every time we truly understand and embrace our identity, man, that's gonna fuel us on towards greater Christ-likeness. Now, Paul does begin because he was writing to a church he hadn't met. He does begin with a question. He says, if then, he doesn't want to make any assumptions that everyone in the room is united to Christ and their fundamental identity is as a Christian. And so in line with Paul, I don't want to make any assumptions this morning, just because you're gathered here that you have understood and believed upon the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And when you turn from your sin and you trust in Jesus Christ, you will be saved and your identity will shift. So if you're not a Christian in this room, confess to the Lord, repent of your sin. I implore Lord, you beg upon Jesus to save you and who will freely do that. You need not do anything to clean yourself up or make yourself feel better. Christ will save you. So first, in these first four verses, we see our identity. Now, this is so important because Paul says, seek the things that are above. Set your mind on the things that are above. In other words, seek Christ. Set your mind upon Christ. Christ. This is who he's talking about when he says the things that are above. We're not talking about the clouds and airplanes and birds. We are talking about the enthroned, matchless King Jesus. And he says, seek after him. He is yours. Now, one truth about the day and age we live in is you become that which you worship. Right? You become what you worship, what your eyes are set upon, the things that you fixate on, the things that you dwell upon. Eventually you become those things, right? We, we have a joke with our kids, like, like Peyton loves carrots and ranch. And we always say to her, if you eat so many carrots, you're going to turn orange, you know, or you're going to become a carrot, like silly Silly jokes like that. But in the same sense, as we dwell upon Christ, as we feast on Christ, as we meditate on Christ, as we fixate on Christ, we will become more like Christ. But we can only do that if we understand we are united with him and to him. So first, we see that we are united to Christ in faith. Next, let's look at our growing pains. Verses 5 through 11. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. 
In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. See that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now we're going to jump into the next two the, the, the vices and virtues list, the put on and the put off. But, but let, me, let me kind of explain what this idea of sanctification is. So when I say sanctification, what I simply mean is growing to look like Christ. And, and one of the things I, I try to always put before us is that we, 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 we kind of struggle with two things as Christians. So what I just talked about over here is our positional identity in Christ. This is who we are. We sang it earlier. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am adopted. I'm a son or daughter of God. This is who I am. But we also have our kind of functional day-to-day identities. So over here in our positional identity, we have been released from the power of sin. Sin no longer wages power over us. We have freedom to not choose sin as Christians. But, but in our functional identities over here, we still have the presence of sin. Each of us still has indwelling sin that we struggle with. Now, the goal of the Christian life is to continue to progress, to bring your functional identity in life line with your positional identity. That's the goal of this Christian life. That's the goal of what Paul is writing here in chapter three. He's trying to convince the Colossian church that you need to move your functional identities along and you do it by putting off some things and putting on some other things. And in this first chapter, the the growing pains chapter, he's talking about the things we need to put off or the things we need to put to death. Now, now think about this. I'm I'm a sports guy. You guys you guys get it, right? I give sports analogies every time I preach. It's I'm not sorry about it. It's all I got. Okay. I'm an expert in in very few things, and sports are one of them. And not even an expert there. Um, now, um, e- each baseball season, uh, when I played baseball in high school, uh, our varsity team every year we'd get new jerseys, right? And it was like the best day. It was the last practice before your first game and they'd hand out the new jerseys and I'd, I'd grab that thing, I'd drive home, I'd go into my room, I'd shut the door, I'd try that jersey on, I'd look in the mirror and be like, yeah, I'm looking good. Look at that, you know? Hey, self-confidence, right? Um, so I'd look in, in the mirror, but, but here's the thing. I, it might look like a fresh new jersey and it might look good, but man, when you get a new jersey, it is terribly uncomfortable right? It doesn't fit you. It's kind of crunchy and starchy and, and, and it's, it's awkward and you got to cut all the tags off because they itch and it doesn't fit you just yet. And the only way to get it to fit you is to continue to wear that jersey, to wash it, to get it dirty, to put some softener on that thing and, and continue to break it in. Or for the ladies in the room, like when Katie and I go to weddings, she loves weddings because she gets to buy new shoes or a new outfit for weddings. And we get to the wedding, she throws on those shoes and and we hit the dance floor and she's smiling like she's happy, but I know she's in terrible pain because those things don't fit, right? And here's how I know it. We get in the car to drive home after the ceremony and what's the first thing she does? Man, she tears those shoes off so fast and her feet are red and throbbing and pulsating. And, and, and yet over time, I'm like, why don't you just wear the same pair of shoes every day? They'll break in, they'll fit you better. It'll be more comfortable. Now, when we become, or before we become Christians, we're wearing these jerseys, these old man jerseys that say rebel or outcast or sinner or fallen short or whatever else. But when we come to Christ, we are given these brand new jerseys and no longer to say rebel or enemy or whatever else. It says son, it says daughter, it says forgiven, it says freed, it says adopted. And yet as new Christians, it's kind of hard to break those things in. It doesn't fit right off the bat. It doesn't feel comfortable. You got to grow in it over time. And, and, And as growing in anything in life is painful, so is growing in this Christian life. Why is it painful? Well, because you're leaving what's familiar. You're leaving what's normal. You're leaving what's easy to step into and embrace the unknown, the the foreign, the thing you're not used to as you're wearing this new jersey as a Christian. And Paul is going to say, it's good for you. Embrace the growing pains because through the pain, there is growth. 
I mean, just think about human life. When you conceive a baby, it's painful. You, you, you start having nausea and morning sickness and, and growing that baby is painful and you can't sleep. I've watched Katie do it twice. I slept okay. She didn't. Um, <laughs> Giving birth is painful. Feeding that baby is painful. Weaning that baby is painful. And then they say teething is like the most painful thing a human can experience. So growing is always marked by pain. And in this Christian life, it's no different. We embrace the pain because we know on the other side of putting off the things that are familiar and easy and comfortable comes the good godly growth. So what does Paul tell us to put off here? Uh, Rather than walk through each of these words, um, word by word, I I saw a a theologian kind of put these sins, so to speak, into three different buckets. And and so I want to just define these buckets as he did. He says there's sins of the eyes, sins of the mouth, and sins of the hand. So he begins with the sins of the hand. He says, we have things like sexual immorality and impurity. What that's talking about is touching and engaging in physical activities outside of God's good design. So when God designed this world and he designed man and woman, he gave us sex as a good gift meant to be enjoyed for the worship of his great name for creating sex. And yet he designed it within the bounds of a covenantal union between man and woman for life. And anytime we step out of that union, we are engaging in this sin of hand, this sexual immorality and this impurity. And, and while it might offer temporal satisfaction, it is not lasting. It is fleeting and you have to go back for more to get more hits. But within the union of marriage, it is ever increasing satisfaction to the worship of God's name. So that's the sin of the hands. And then Paul will talk about the sins of the eyes. He says, passion and evil desires and covetousness. Now, sins of the eyes means we look upon things that do not belong to us. And in an evil way, we plot for those things to become ours. We look at other people, we look at their lives, we look at their materials, and we look at what we don't have, and we wish ill upon them so that we might possess what they have. We might receive what they have. And it begins with your eyes as we look at other things. And then finally, Paul says there's sins of the mouth, lying and gossip and slander and anger and malice. This is speaking curses over others. This is the verbal undressing of someone in a way that intends to cause them, cause them harm. It is speaking ill of others, wanting them to be wounded. Now, I don't need to go through this list because if we're being honest with ourselves, we just look at this thing and we see how fallen and flawed and sinful we are. We become viscerally aware. This past week, man, I just was encountering God's word and confessing things in my heart that I didn't know were there as God revealed it through his word. It's easy for us to see where we have fallen short. So what do we do with that? Paul uses some serious language here. He says, put these things to death. Kill it mortify it, abandon it, defeat it. This is serious military language. Put these things to death. Why does Paul want us to be so serious about sin? There's two reasons why. First, Paul knows that sin promises a bill of goods it can never deliver on. Sin will always promise you an eternal satisfaction, but it can never deliver that. Satisfaction is only rightly sourced in Jesus Christ. So when we engage in sin, it's enjoyable for a fleeting second, but it always wears off. We all know this. But Paul knows that God is what is best for us and God has what's best for us. We need to put to death the sinful things that block the way of us seeking the one that is above, setting our mind on the one that is above. But the second reason why Paul is so serious about putting these to death is right there in verse six. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. That's a hard truth that really in, in 2020 is, is not easy to preach or talk about, but, but God is wrathful. He is a God of wrath and he is perfectly just in doing that. When God created this world, he created it in perfection and we were meant to live with him and with each other in harmony. And then we ushered sin into the world and it fractured everything and we ruined and marred God's good design. 
And God, because he is just, and God, because he is holy, and God, because he is righteous, cannot be in the presence of sin, and he must rightly punish sin and sinners. And this is his wrath. On account of sin, his wrath is coming. But friend, there's a way out. Jesus Christ on the cross bore the wrath of God in our place, fully satisfied it. So when you came to Christ Jesus, God did not save up any wrath for you. There is no more wrath for the Christian, only mercy and grace and kindness and generosity. But friends, we must be serious about sin because on account of sin, the wrath of God is coming. And so if you're outside of Christ, again, let me just implore you, throw yourself upon the mercies of Christ. The riches of his grace cannot run out or run dry, and he will satisfy the wrath of God in your place. So we see our growing pains. And and here's the thing about growing in holiness. On the other end of holiness is happiness. We walk into sin seeking happiness, but holiness leads to happiness. So let us be a church that pursues holiness by putting to death the old man, by refusing to put on the old jersey, by refusing to walk in sin. Next, let's look at the ideal man, the ideal. Verses 12 through 14. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in harmony. Now, we're putting to death these old things where we've taken off the old jersey, but that's not just where it ends. Paul will paint for a picture, paint a picture for us of what it looks like to put on our God-given identities. So in this idea of progressive sanctification, where we're bringing our functional identities in alignment with our positional identities, there's two things that are going to make that happen. The first is what's called mortification. We just talked about that, putting to death sin. But the second thing is just as important as mortification and it's called vivification. All right. It's a big word for saying cultivating things that cause you to look like Jesus, cultivating habits in your life that fix your eyes and your loves and your disciplines upon him alone. Now, the, the, the reason why I really want to talk about vivification is because we are great at the negative, right? Go turn on the news for like 14 seconds and you'll see three stories that are all negative and terrible. And you're going to be angry. Go on Twitter. Spend a few minutes on Twitter. I dare you. You'll walk away hostile, like wanting to hurt somebody. Like we are constantly in this vacuum of negative. And and I'm not saying that in kind of like a prosperity gospel sense where it's like, don't have negative thoughts. I'm talking about what is the message that you are surrounded by in the culture. And it's all negative and terrible. And, and so when we talk about this growth into Christ likeness, this progressive sanctification, what we're really easy at is mortification. What we're really easy at is seeing how terrible we are and wanting to put our sin to death. But Paul doesn't say in those verses five through 11, focus on your sin. He didn't say focus on your sin anywhere. Awareness in your, of your sin, yes, that. But focus on it, no. What does he tell us to focus on? Christ. Seek the things that are above. Set your mind on the thing that is above. And this is where vivification comes in, where we set our minds upon Christ Jesus, where we set our minds upon things that are compassionate and kind and humility and meekness and patience and bearing with one another and forgiveness and above all, put on love. Now, when I read those words, who am I describing? Jesus, right? It's a Sunday school answer, come on. Who am I describing? Every time, just say that and you'd be confident, all right? I'm going to trick you next time. This is called the ideal man because God doesn't demand perfection from us, but he does demand progress of us. Jesus is the ideal. Jesus is what we're striving after. And these traits are what, as Christians, in a gospel-focused way, we try to cultivate in our hearts and our minds. And we vivify these things. And we must do that with an understanding that in verse 12, we are God's chosen ones, his holy and beloved. This is who we are, Christian. God chose you. 
And not because you earned it, but because he loves you. For the foundation of the world, he set his sights upon you and said, I will redeem you. Even though I know all the sin you will commit against me, you will be mine. We are his. We are holy because of Christ. We are beloved because of Christ. When God sees us, he says, you are my beloved and in you I am well pleased. And so with the fuel of that and the confidence of that and the, and the joy of that, we move to, to, to cultivate these things in our lives. So how can we do that? How can we vivify? How can we build up Christ-likeness in our lives? I've got nine things. So I'll just do some of them. First, <laughs> love God's word. Man, dwell upon God's word. The reason why first week of January we started with a word-driven church is because we know this will vivify Christ in you. This will build up Christ in you. Dwell upon God's word. Love God's word. Spend time in it. If you don't know how, man, come to a brother or sister in Christ and say, hey, I need help with my Bible. Listen, if I could be asked that question, golly, nothing would send me over the moon like that. And there are so many people in this church that would love to say, Let's get a cup of coffee and talk about God's word. Love God's word. Spend much time communing with God in prayer. Be in his presence. Practice the presence of God. Dwell on on what is beautiful and right and good. I mean, the heavens declare the majesty of God. God created this world as habits for us to enjoy, to worship him. So enjoy food and wine and laughter and friendship and good movies and go camping and go hiking. And when you do these things, don't do them in a self-centered way, but do them in a God-centered way where every Everything you're enjoying flows up into enjoyment of God, where you see God's creation. I mean, when those winds came through and the smog was blown off those mountains, you saw some of those sunsets. Gosh, worship of God. Dwell upon these things. Savor God's grace to you. Listen, the the, the inward pull of the human heart when we sin is to try to conceal, to run, to hide. But God is always begging of you, run to me. Find more grace. When you sin, saint, don't run from God, run to God. Don't run from God's people, run to God's people. And you'll find more grace and more mercy that you could never exhaust. Savor that. Sit in that. Actually live your life with other Christians, not just for one hour a week. We try to say this. This gathering is so important. Hebrews 10 would would say, don't neglect this gathering. And by the way, 9 a.m., PSA, we start at (laughs) 9. Amen. (laughs) But this gathering is one part of a lot of parts of your Christian life meant to be lived with other Christians throughout the week. Cultivate good, godly friendships to live life with other Christians. We got home groups for that. Rehearse your salvation. If you're ever down and out, remember the point of salvation. And whether you were four or 40, it was just as miraculous. No matter how heinous or grievous your sin, every salvation is a miracle of God. Rehearse your salvation, Christian. Listen to music. All right, that's way down on my list. You can tell what I like. Um, Listen to good, godly, theologically rich music. Dwell upon it. We have our Spotify playlist that you can go and listen to those. If you're looking for a playlist, you don't want to curate yourself, go to that. The songs that we sing on Sundays, they're thoughtful and thought out. And and so think about them and, and dwell upon your music. We have an entire book of the Bible that are songs meant to lift our eyes off of our silly circumstances and to fix them on the matchless King Jesus. Listen to music. All right, that's enough. I'm watching the clock. Now, vivify, and there's so many other things we can talk about. Finally, let's see our communal growth. Verses 15 through 17. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Friends, as I read verses 5 through 14, this put off and put on, I am yearning 
for that growth in my life. I am wanting my life to look the way Paul describes it here. And yet I know I'm not there, but the only way I'm going to get there is with you. The only way any one of us are gonna get there is together because the Christian life is not individual and it's not isolated. The Christian life is always communal, which is why church membership is so important when we throw our hat in and we say, this is my family and I am committed to their growth and they're committed to my growth. We need each other. And here's where I'm seeing that. In verses 15 through 17, you see one another on repeat. You say, see thankfulness in your hearts. This is plural. You, you see um, the, the word you. Now, because I spent some time in Texas, any, any other Southerners in here or people who lived in the South? There's a few of us. Listen, the South has the translation game on lock for the Bible. The English translation of the Bible sometimes falls a little short in the way it translates you, right? It's not you singular, it's you plural. So in the South, we say y'all. And one of the best ways to think about how you read the word you here in these verses is the way you hear the word y'all and let the peace of Christ rule in y'all's hearts to indeed, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in y'all richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in y'all's hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. We are meant to do this life with each other, with one another, with y'all. And so Paul is writing to an entire church. This is read aloud in the assembly. And he's saying, you hear these things, do these things together, get after this together. So, So when I am not seeing sin in my own life, because no one is as blind to your sin as you are, When I'm not seeing my own sin, I need another believer who loves me and that I trust to come to me and say, I'm seeing some things there. Let's talk about that. And when I'm falling short on building up Christ's likeness in my life and cultivating godly habits, I need another Christian in this church to come alongside me and say, hey, I'll do this with you. You can't do this alone. You're gonna run out of gas. Let's do this together. So let me um, just put my last week on display to talk about how this got worked out in the Cunningham home. So the Cunninghams for generations have been proud of their work ethic, right? If there's a list of virtues in this world that Cunninghams have, it's like at the top of the list is hard work. And there's a, not even a close second. It's really distant. Like we're going to work. This is who we are. We work and we provide. And that's not a bad thing. Like working is good. And if you're not working, man, get after it. But Oftentimes for me, this work can veer into workaholism, which is just an easy way to say sin in work, where I am using work as an addiction. And like any addiction, I am using work to escape. I'm using work to hide my weakness. I'm using work to hide my insecurities and my own shortcomings. And I use work to make myself feel better about how I'm doing in life. I'm working hard. I look at the calendar. I'm like, man, I must be doing some things right. Neglecting so much going on here. And and, and in the midst of stepping into workaholism, what I'm doing is I'm neglecting God and I'm neglecting my wife and I'm neglecting my children. I'm neglecting all these good things that God has given to me. Now, Katie and and I have a vacation coming up that was just so generously gifted to us by God. And, and three or four folks in this church who dearly love us have been uh, gently admonishing us, if we can say it that way, um, through, through some, some very clear means and through some less clear means. Here's what I mean. They, they've reached out to us and they've said, hey, you guys are really terrible at having fun. You guys are really bad at turning work off. I got an email this past week that was like, I mean, paragraphs of like helpful tips on how to disengage on vacation. And I'm like, I get the point, okay? I know, I'm not good at this. But in the midst of that, what they're showing me and and through some more direct conversations, there's been like, hey, when you go on this vacation, disengage, put the phone away, put the computer away. Don't think about work. Don't even bring any theological books with you. Bring your Bible and your family, enjoy them and enjoy God. Fully disengage that you might more fully engage when you reimmerse. And in the midst of that, they're also following up and saying, hey, when you get back, let's talk about some healthy rhythms for your life. 
so you don't just step right back into it. A vacation is not just a temporary pause. How can we get this to be a total life thing for you and your family? How can we better manage your calendar and your work and the way you are viewing these things? Now, they loved me and Katie enough to come up to us and say, hey, you guys are sinning against each other here. You guys need to put these things away and in place of it, do some of these things and watch God work. Now, I didn't have a willingness to see that. I didn't have a willingness to embrace that. I needed another believer in this church to come and point that out to me and then also to walk alongside me and how to grow there. And that's just a really easy example of how this type of growth works out, this communal growth. So let me just recap what we've seen. In the first part, we see that Jesus, through the gospel, has given us new identities. We are forgiven because of Christ. In verses 5 through 11, we see the power of sin no longer wages over us, but now we have the, the power of the indwelling sin to say, or the indwelling spirit to say no to sin. And then in part three, we see that we now have remaining sin, or re- I'm all off here, guys. We have, we have a desire to pursue Christ because of who God has made us. And finally, we see that we do it together. Friends, this is what God wants for us. So let us pursue it together. Let's, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that because of Christ, our identity can go from being enemy and sinner to friend and child. We thank you that you sent your son and that he lived the life we couldn't live and that he hung from a cross that we deserve to hang from. And on that cross, he canceled our record of debt. He satisfied your wrath that we deserve. He put the enemy to open shame. We thank you, God, that he died the death we deserved and he laid in a tomb that we should have been in. And God, we worship you that that tomb is now empty. Three days later, he was raised to new life and in him we can be raised to new life. So God, I thank you for that gospel truth. And I pray that as a church in here, for the Christians in this room, we would have a sincere desire to pursue holiness to pursue Christ-likeness, to put off the old man and to become like Christ Jesus and that we would become holy so that we can be a city set on a hill where the watching world will see us and our holiness would be contagious. I pray we would pursue holiness because we know on the other end of holiness is true satisfaction and happiness and joy. All the things we're looking for in sin cannot be found there, but can only be found in our Savior, Christ. I pray you would help us cultivate eyes that seek him and set our mind upon him. God, I pray for the non-Christians in the room that you would redeem them today that they would see that the wages of sin is death and the wrath of God is coming for them, but Christ in their place can absolve that and give them their righteousness. Would you give them the gift of repentance and faith? And then God, I pray you would bind us together as one body, pursuing holiness together, pursuing growth together, not abandoning one another, not forsaking one another, but becoming like Christ and sticking with one another. God, we love you in Christ's name, amen.